Teresa Price. She is bold, gutsy, innovative, and faithful. Coming from a background of abuse, Christine's personal testimony is one of healing and restoration, which has fueled the gift within her to see others set free. The desire to see human slavery addressed and abolished is also a prevailing and driving force in her life and ministry. She's a close friend whom I love dearly, and I can't imagine doing this journey without her. So lean in, her testimony and passion are truly inspiring. Welcome to Color Green Room. We are here at Color Conference 2017. Now, listen, you're going to hear a bunch of noise in the background. That's because we got a set going on here. It's a beautiful set. We set up this nice little green room right area in the foyer, right That's in the amazing. middle of the foyer. But we have on the couch none other than Miss Christine Payne herself. Welcome. Hey, I'm so pumped to be here. My goodness. Now, listen, I got to go over her resume because your resume, girlfriend, it is one. <laughs> Come on, this is not your average resume, okay? That's true, that's true. We're talking about Christine Kane is an international speaker. She's an author, co-founder of A21, which is an anti-human trafficking organization, founder of Propel Women. I mean, do you have any time? Do you yeah. have any other time? <laughs> you forgot that she's also a wife and a mother. Yes. Yeah, it's just to Two add gorgeous that girls, wife, mom. Uh, is there any free time? You're hilarious. He's like, oh, who are you talking about? Okay, yeah. <laughs> I love it. And it's, did you always, you, you know, know from a child, like, this is what I'm going to do? No, you know, I mean, I was just listening to you go through all of that. And I honestly don't spend that much time thinking about it because I feel um, some of the things that have uh, grown out of my life, I think, are a testimony to the redemption of God in my life. So wow. um, it is... You know, I, I was a kid, I mean, we're here in Sydney, and this is you know, the 21st colour, and it's my 21st colour, like I've been at all of them, so I'm just woven into the fabric of all of this. Oh, them all. Yeah, this is, I've been doing them all since day one with Come Bobby, on. and um, in fact, I had my 15-year-old daughter, Catherine, was born the day before one of the colours, 15 years ago, and so I had a C-section, and then I uh, actually... D discharge myself so that I could come as to colour as, as I do. do. Yeah, yeah. After C-section. <laughs> the next day. So next that I could day. do very the normal <laughs> and the offering back then. Yes, okay. So um, so this this conference is, when I say woven into the fabric, like I, I feel like, you know, my blood, sweat and tears along with many others, but it's in the very soil of yeah. this. And, and the, what we're seeing now and nine conferences around the world um, have always was always the dream that a, a sisterhood that would truly impact the world so and I think part of that my own personal story so I was born you know 10 minutes down the road left in a hospital which I didn't find out until I was 33 but that I was abandoned in a hospital down the road um, left there unnamed unwanted wow and then um, my parents who were Greek immigrants from Alexandria in Egypt uh, they adopted me and then um, raised me wow. uh, Greek girl, Greek Orthodox wow, girl here in on. Sydney, Australia. Pre my big fat Greek wedding when it was not cool to be Greek in Australia. Very quite marginalised back wow, in the sixties wow. and seventies for our ethnicity. But um, and then you know I experienced abuse for twelve years of my life, and um, with abuse comes so much shame, so much uh, brokenness and bitterness and unforgiveness. And um, I think I was just a textbook back case. I was very very broken. So I had abandonment, I had rejection, I had abuse. Wow. So I. In, through my late teens, was very relationally broken, extremely relationally broken, and um, then at about 20, 21 years old, a friend invited me to Hillsong Church in um, Castle Hill, and um, there I truly uh, encountered, I had known Jesus, but encountered him in a very life transforming way was discipled and um, kind of have never left so you know for Come me on. when you sell that other stuff I just kind of like yeah out of out of all of that then as I allowed uh, Jesus to do the recovery work in my life you know um, I was very very broken so when I, I, I ruined my knee maybe um, five, six years ago, I was skiing, and I snapped my ACL, tore my MCL, tore my meniscus, did the whole lot. They had to put me in a ski patrol, take me down the mountain, put me wow. in an ambulance, you know, and then I had a hamstring graft. And after I had the hamstring graft, it's a really painful surgery, really. The PT came up to me afterwards, and he said, Chris, most people don't recover from the kind of accident you've had, because it was really serious. Um, not fully, like as in fully yeah. running again, and you know, having full mobility in my knee. They said, but you can recover, but most don't, um, because 
the pain of recovery is far greater than the pain of the injury. The injury happens in an instant, but the recovery process over several months um, is a lot longer. So you can recover fast or slow, um, totally or partially. It is entirely up to you. But the degree to which you are willing to embrace the pain of recovery is the degree to which you'll recover. Come on. And so my deal is that um, I was 21 years old. I'm now 51 this year. So it was 30 years ago that I walked into our church. Now, definitely I'm not like I was. I'm not in intensive care anymore. But I have been in recovery for 30 years. And uh, by allowing God to do that painful work of weeding out the pain um, of the shame and the abuse and the brokenness. You know, when you start being abused, uh, you, I mean, I was little, my first recollection, my first conscious memory, I was three years old. So I don't actually ever have a recollection of not being ashamed. And so, um, because when you first start getting abused, you think what is happening to you is wrong. But when it keeps happening, you start to think there's something wrong with you. That's yeah. why it's happening. And so my default, and to this day, if I don't really, I probably preach so much because it's for myself. Um, my natural default is there's something wrong with me. Mm. Instantly, what did I do? It must be my fault. There's something wrong with me. And, um, you know, the enemy in Genesis 2.25, the very last thing that... Um, it says, after God created Adam and Eve, he says, Adam and Eve were naked and they knew no shame. It doesn't say they knew no fear or jealousy or guile or anger or joy. It says shame. So of all of the words God could have used, of all the human emotions, the one word he used was they were naked and unashamed. So the thing that God created us to never feel, Adam and Eve were naked and they felt no shame. We were never meant to feel it. If I was the devil, what is the one thing I'm going to go for, for all of humanity yep. throughout all of time, is the one thing humanity was never created to okay. feel. So then we get to Genesis 3, and then begins the journey into shame. So, And the devil always starts, same old pattern, he comes into the garden and says to Eve, um, did God really say? The question will always be, to an entire generation, always has been, did God really say? Because if you do not know what God said, you will always believe what so you good. say, That's what someone else says, right. what anybody else says. And then... Here's the interesting thing. Eve responds in Genesis 3 with God did say. So you can even be a religious Christian and know what God says. But if you do not believe that your God is good, that your God does good, then the devil will always undermine the character of God because he said, yeah, but God doesn't want you to eat of that because he doesn't want you to be like him. God doesn't want you not to sleep with that guy because he doesn't want you to miss out on having a good time. Or he does. He'll always undermine the character of God. But the lie is always, he says to Eve, God doesn't want you to be like him. The fact was that Eve already was like God. She was already created in the image of God. She already was like God. But the lie is you are not enough. That's what shame does. You are not enough. You are missing out. So either you're too much or you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not thin enough. You're not eloquent enough. You're not talented enough. God doesn't want you to do that because then you're going to become better than him. And so there's the lie. It's like I already am. And that's why our job has to be to discover who we are. Now, this journey for me is huge because I was left unnamed and unwanted. Yeah. So I never knew who I was in I'm, Christ. I want to stop you there yeah, because yeah. I want to talk about now that shift because you have a book called Unashamed. Yeah, I do. Yeah. And I love that. And we're going to be right back with Christine Kane. You're not going to want to miss this. It's all happening right here on Color Green Room. We confuse it. So we think I did something bad, therefore I'm bad. That's where the enemy gets in. And so if you don't separate what you did from who you are in Christ, you are going to live your whole life limited because um, shame paralyzes you, it cripples you, it makes you shrink, it makes you pull back, which is what the devil wants you to do. Spend your Saturdays with Bobby Houston. The pre Welcome back to Color Green Room. We are here with Christine Kane, international speaker, author. I, her resume goes on, but I'm not going to take a minute more because I want to talk more about, we were talking about shame. Yeah, it, And you wrote a book called Unashamed. Yeah. Now, the shame, that the bondage of shame is that grip that it can have on people is it can choke the life out of you. Well, always. And, and you know, we were saying that um, right in the Garden of Eden, that's what the enemy went for, shame, because shame tells you that you're fundamentally unworthy. So I'm not enough, you know. Um, and a lot of people feel either not enough because of things that they've done and or things that have been done to them. But I think a lot of us, what we do confuse is guilt and shame. Yeah. Healthy guilt is a good thing. Guilt is 
are as a result of something that you've done. So it's your do. So Jesus forgives us. Shame is our who. Shame says, I am bad. Guilt says, I did something wrong. Wow. I can take wow. the I did something wrong to the foot of the cross. Yeah. There is nothing that Jesus Christ cannot yeah. redeem, does not forgive, does not restore. But so some of that healthy guilt sometimes is really great because it brings you to the foot of the cross and it causes you to repent. It's God's yeah. kindness that leads us to repentance. And so it's a powerful thing. But a lot of us, we cannot, uh, we confuse our who and our do. So we think I did something bad, therefore I'm bad. That's wow. where the enemy gets in. Wow. And so if you don't separate what you did from who you are in Christ, you are going to live your whole life limited because um, shame paralyzes you. It cripples you. It makes you shrink. It makes you pull back, which is what the devil wants you to do. But how do you break through that? There are so many things you need to do. But I still think it comes down to the three things in Genesis 3 when the enemy said, did God really say? So you've got to know mm -hmm. what God says. Then um, you have a look at what happened because this is what we do. And I think this explains how. That when Adam and Eve, when they ate of the forbidden fruit, God's walking in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. And then you have the first words that God speaks to humankind um, in the Bible. The very first word of God to Adam and Eve is, where are you? So because the Bible, and Adam says, I was naked, ashamed, and so I hid. So right in the first conversation, God's going, where'd you go? Yeah. And man's going, fear, shame, vulnerability, mm -hmm. and hiding. First conversation in the Bible. Between, and, I mean, this just sums up where we still are. All of this Come time on. later is that we do something and we run from yeah. God. And the Bible says that they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. How ridiculous. I sort of <laughs> try to cover that, which is what we do. You know, we're like, we, we try to cover. Now, we cover ourselves in many different ways, either by... I'm going to show my dad and I'm going to become the corporate CEO or mm. I'm going to show that ex-lover and I'm going to jump into bed with, I'm going to show them I can get 10 different guys yeah. or um, we cover it by medicating it with prescription medication just too much, having that extra glass of wine, um, jumping from one bed to the other, trying to somehow go, I'm covering. In, in, in many ways, it's like I'm covering my shame. Um, or I'm just going to go into hiding or I'm not going to let people know who I really am because if they do they're not going to like me because I'm just unworthy or I'm too shy I'm too or I'm just too much you know in my case growing up uh, as a Greek girl you know my parents would say to me Christine um, don't read too many books because if you're too smart no man will want to marry you so there was a shame of even how God uh, created me you know with an intellect um, you know don't don't try to aspire to too good a job because you know a man's not going to like that or you're going to intimidate them tone down your personality a little bit don't be mrs black in my third grade class in my uh june report midyear report wrote christine is very strong and must learn that she cannot always be the leader and then obviously that so devastated me because i mean she's not knowing i'm being abused at home school was where i was finding some of my value and Obviously, God wanted to use my leadership gifts, so the devil's always going to come for the thing that God's going to use you for in the future. I so internalized that, that I'm too strong, I shouldn't be a leader, that I remember consciously in third grade deciding I'm never going to lead anything again. I'm going to wow. always just wait. And so it must have worked because then in my third grade report, it says in the second half of the year, Christine has calmed down and is a very well-behaved, wow. uh, gentle student now. And that was me making a decision at nine years old I'm not going to say anything anymore. I'm not going to put my hand up to do. And yet God knew that I would raise up a, a leadership That's movement right. for Come women. On. God knew that there would be rejection. But you've got to fight. But the point is it doesn't just happen. Yeah. Because then what that caused was a lot of scar tissue. Yeah. What that caused was a lot of brokenness. It was like when my knee was being, the pain is because of the scar tissue yeah. that I had built in order to protect myself. That's what we do with shame. We try to cover ourselves like the fig leaves. And so... Do you remember that moment you became unashamed, like oh, yeah, what you time had to do? It's an ongoing, no, no, that's why I don't want anyone watching this. I think that's where sometimes we can, and I love size teaching at this conference, mm -hmm. um, because it's very powerful. And this is why you go, why do some Christians seem to come through the other side? Why mm -hmm. does a Christine Kane, who was left in a hospital unnamed and wanted, who was abused, uh, who just encountered different forms of shame, why is she at 51, by the grace of God, you know, appears... It, he still walks with a limp, but he's flourishing in her marriage, has two children, and is running these things. I would hate anyone to think that it just happened. I would wow. hate anyone to think Good. that I've actually arrived anywhere. Good. Other than 
I have learned a greater dependence and trust of God. That's all I could say. I, I, it's not, um, it's not, a it's not like now I'm back and wow, I've arrived. Because my truth is, if you only knew my moment by moment interdependence on the Holy Spirit of God. And so for me, the journey hasn't been, wow, look what Chris Kane's doing. This is an outflow of the gifts and talents that God's given me. It's part of the call of God on my life that the enemy tried to block. But to be able to allow God to bring healing on an ongoing basis, um, especially if you've been the victim of any, or had any victimization, but sexual abuse in particular probably, is your trust of the goodness of the character of God. That's what the devil's always going for. Do, do you trust the character of God? So we sing, you know, you're a good, good father. We start the conference with that. The fact is, you know, at, at this conference, there's 8,000 women. 7,000 of them are singing it. And I wonder, really, is it has it been internalized? Um, really, really, that you're a good, good father. Mm. Now, if we can take the gap, because we need the worship songs. This is how it happens. So you say it. And I didn't believe it for a really long time. No way. Because I, if you were a good father, especially my early days of, of counselling, why did you not stop? How at three years old could I stop that abuse? What did I do? If you're a good father, a good father would not allow that to happen. A good So believing God is different to believing truths about God. Wow. And so, um, but that process is so for me, the scripture in First John, God is light and in him there is no darkness. I, pr I had that, I'm a very big believer, writing scripture, sticking it on my mirror, maybe for five years straight. I had to say that until one day, I'm out of cry just thinking, um, I just looked at the mirror and went, you don't have a dark side. Just because people have a dark side wow. doesn't mean you have a dark side. And it, it took me years, and I mean, of, of being in church, of singing our songs of worship until I could honestly, at the core of my being, go, God is light, and in Him, He has no dark side. If we would embrace the pain of recovery, knowing that by His wounds we are healed, but that's not an instant zap. There's a healing process. Yeah. There is freedom from shame. There is hope from shame, and God can redeem every broken mess of your past to give you an awesome future. So what's my, been my Christian journey over the last 30 years? It's identifying the lies. And the only way you really identify them is you stumble over something and you say something or you do something or a trigger comes up and you're like, I don't even know, what, why did I react like that? Why did I say that? Why did yeah. I do that? Um, or someone is going to tell you the truth in love and you're going to have this reaction. And then if you can get into the God zone and you allow the Holy Spirit, again, it's His kindness, that leads you to repentance. It's the the work of the Holy Spirit to convict us. See, this is why I'm very big on saying, you don't arrive. Because if at 51, what, am I so healed that I don't need Jesus anymore? Wow. Is that the deal? Is that like I've turned up and because I'm a speaker and yeah. because I run A21 or Propel, um, do, do I not need Jesus as on, much as the woman that's in recovery? As yeah. much as exactly the same amount. So I have exactly the same amount of need for the amazing grace of Jesus and the healing and the restoration. Now, some obvious patterns of destructive behavior are not there, and I've been in Christian culture enough that I can mask it anyway for a really long time, Ooh, better than anybody else. So that's on, like not even on. the deal, which is why God, he says to the prophet Samuel, he doesn't look at the outside like man right. does. He and looks at the heart. Fine. And so we've turned Christianity into a behavior modification program Ooh. rather than a heart transformation program. So if we allow God to come into the depths of our heart, and it's painful. Yeah. But if you actually truly believe that your Savior is enough mm -hmm. and you actually get a revelation of who you are Come in on. Him, all the striving, so you labor to enter into that place of rest, that rest yes. in the love of God, that in quietness and confidence wow. will be your strength. That is in, if nobody sees me, not even out of a false humility. Yeah. I think that's why the Bible says, humble yourself. That's not like, uh, thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. One of the greatest freedoms I've had, um, from my abuse, from shame, is that I think of myself less because I was on my mind all the time. When you're broken, yeah, when no. you're wounded, all you're thinking yeah. about, like a needy child, me, 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 I, 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 I. And so when you see that, 
It means there's broken fragments of our but with soul. With that shame, are you? Doesn't it come like you're embarrassed to let God even go in because you're so yeah. you're ashamed? So how do you get to? to you have to be. To, but again, it comes to uh, vulnerability. There, and again, I say there's no easy yeah. way. So it's where you finally. Um, I have to get on your knees before the Lord well, and go, you, you know what, yeah, do it. That's, that's, that, that's right what it would be. And for me, I mean, it, it, I think you're vulnerable enough with a person, you know, a brother or a sister in Christ that that wants your good. And I've certainly in my early days of my healing from shame, um, Sai, 30 years ago, was very crucial in my own life, my own healing, my own redemption. I wouldn't be married if it wasn't for him. Wow. Um, the, the night before my wedding, I, Nick and I went to here. I didn't think I would be able to go through with it, not with all of my brokenness. So, you know, I was, I was size half of why I'm married today. And, uh, <laughs> but just that. like, because I, I, I mean, because you're carrying all of that baggage, yeah. which is why we, you know, have so many unraveling marriages because yeah. you, you're bringing all of you, all of that stuff that you think you've locked down and put a padlock on. You've got to give God the key to that double deadlock padlock, those silent yes. vows, no one will ever, I will never, I, with the vows that we make, and uh, see, we put up boundaries at first to protect ourselves that eventually become prisons that lock God out of the very places that he wants to come and bring healing and restoration, and that's where a lot of Christians operate, in a prison of their own boundary, they don't yeah. let the Holy Spirit in, because it's tender. But if we could understand that it's a healing balm, and that it's like any wound. You know, when I came to Christ, like all of us, I was a gaping wound, yeah. just gaping. Yeah. And you did, so you would I put Band-Aids on it, like yeah. we all do, a yeah. nice Band-Aid. Yeah. But if you pressed it, it would seep out. Now, I might think it's hidden, yeah. but it's just yeah. coming out everywhere. I had to let the Holy Spirit come in and squeeze that gunk, redress the entire thing. And so now, I have scars, they're never going to go away. Yeah. The blood of Jesus does not give you amnesia. Mm. See, you can't just go, oh, Ooh, it's under the blood. It's under the blood. Goodness. I wasn't abused, I wasn't abused. That's called lying. Faith yeah. is not calling those things that are as though they are not. It's calling those things that are not as though they were. So I was abused. Nothing would change that. But um, I called forth my healing that wasn't yet manifest and began to appropriate wow. it over that place till I got there. So the blood of Jesus, it doesn't give us amnesia, it gives us something even better. It gives us a life beyond our past. Wow. And so that healing, so now what was scars of shame yeah. have become a trophy of the grace of God now. That's right. So That's how much right. more as I stand before a generation and say, look, I, I got, I was abused, yeah. I was abandoned, I was adopted, I, I committed so much of my own sexual sin. I, I just, you yeah. know, there was so much. Here it all is, but but now let me tell you about the redeemer of my soul that brought restoration and this is the and so when i sit with a traffic victim who has had to service 40 men a day who has had unbelievable atrocities done to her and she looks at me and wants some hope i'm not just giving her some theology that i think maybe is real i can sit there and roll up my own sleeves and go sweetheart let me tell you come on, there's not a pit deep enough that i haven't walked in where you have been and i've come down and i have found you in the bottom of that pit and our savior like i'm just skin and bones carrier of god and we're going to lift you out of this pit and the same god come that on. pulled me out of this pit the same god that redeemed he works all things even every bad thing that you've done and that was done to you that's what my life is a testimony of. It doesn't say all things are good, but even the bad things that happen, God is able to work, work all of those into it. He weaves it into a tapestry of his grace and mercy, and he turns all of those things around and works them together for his glory and for our good. If we would embrace the pain of recovery, knowing that by his wounds we are healed, but that's not an instant zap. There's a healing process. Yeah. And if we understand that the healing process then provides the strength that now you can jump on those scars, it's not going to touch me. Whereas before um, you touched it, I would unravel. So there is freedom from shame. There is hope from shame. And God can redeem every broken mess of your past to give Ooh. you an awesome future. And he does That's exceedingly right. abundantly above and beyond. That's right. That's what he does. Ooh. <laughs> Listen, I hope y'all press record because I, seriously, I, I didn't want to be rude because I was wanting to take notes. I was like, we need to press rewind on that. Ooh, that was a heavy, that was an amazing, amazing session on the couch with Miss Christine Kane herself. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you next time right here at Color Green Room. Join us next time as we have the dynamic mother-daughter duo, Julia and Harmony Avell, on the couch. Julia, alongside her husband Joel, 
is the lead pastor of Hillsong Australia. They are a huge blessing to Brian and I as they outwork the vision of our church across all our Australian campuses. Together, as mother and daughter, Jules and Harmony chat about the call of God, the balance of family, and a desire to see God's kingdom advance without hindrance. See you then.